This video will contain spoilers for Inland Empire, as well as David Lynch's web series Rabbits and his films Eraserhead, Lost Highway, and Mulholland Drive. If you don't want any of those spoiled, now's your time to go watch those things. And I would also recommend my videos on Eraserhead, Lost Highway, and Mulholland Drive on this channel, as it may help you understand this film better as well. Inland Empire is a difficult film to understand. It's a difficult film to discuss, too. After all, the film was shot without a screenplay, which essentially makes it a stream of consciousness art project more than a traditional narrative. There is meaning here, and there's a lot to talk about, but the presentation of the film is so cryptic, so incoherent by design, that in order to be able to discuss the meaning of the film, we first have to try to understand some of the key elements. Those key elements would be the accompanying web series Rabbits, the film within a film, On High and Blue Tomorrows, the various roles played by recurring actors, the tagline, A Woman in Trouble, and the various themes that span across the movie as a whole. The title comes from a region in Southern California nicknamed the Inland Empire. It's a big area of cities northeast of Los Angeles that's generally speaking a more impoverished and cheaper area. A lot of people who work in LA live in the Inland Empire because it's cheaper and commute to LA. I used to live in the Inland Empire myself a few years ago and it's a pretty harsh area to live in, though I imagine it's gotten much worse since 2006 when the film was made. The Inland Empire is never really featured in the film and is only mentioned once by name, but during the film there is a conversation between two homeless women where one of them mentions a friend of hers who lives out in Pomona, which is debatably not a part of the Inland Empire, but when I was living there it seemed like it was part of the same area and a lot of people do consider it part of the Inland Empire. So I'd assume that David Lynch was referring to Pomona as a city in the Inland Empire for the sake of the film. Her story also mentions that this friend would wear a blonde wig in Paris, and by that I assume she meant Paris, California, which is just about dead center in the IE. The story that the homeless woman tells helps a lot with understanding the film, but I want to save that for later when I discuss the themes more in depth. So for now, I'll just say that the name Inland Empire, as well as the association that the title has with the area, and that both have an association with this homeless woman's story, all seem to be centered around this vague theme of making something remarkable even in the hardest of times. A few years before completing Inland Empire, David Lynch released a series of web videos called Rabbits. The full series, minus a few episodes that I don't know any means of accessing, is available on YouTube. The series stars three anthropomorphic rabbits named Jack, Jane, and Susie, all of whom are played by actors from Lynch's previous film, Mulholland Drive, which has a lot of possible implications about a connection between the two films. Rabbits could hypothetically have a whole video dedicated to it, but I thought that I might as well incorporate my thoughts on rabbits into this video and just get it out of the way now. I honestly don't have a very clear idea of what rabbits is about. The series is a very strange parody of a sitcom with non sequitur dialogue and an inexplicable laugh track. I imagine that Lynch wanted to highlight the idea that what we're seeing is fake, using the laugh track as a means of making it as clear as possible that what we're watching is not real. That's a theme that plays well in the Inland Empire if that's the idea behind Rabbits. The series as a whole is pretty unsettling to watch and kind of a chore to sit through, though any dedicated Lynch fans will probably enjoy it at least on some level. The reason why I bring up Rabbits is because the series and characters in the series are featured prominently in Inland Empire. And while the series on its own is hard to understand, it does provide context for Inland Empire that's very useful. The dialogue to Rabbits is not actually complete nonsense, but rather there are two separate things happening. First is a series of dialogue pieces that are split up and put in a seemingly random order, where when you take the individual lines that each character speaks and figure out the correct order, you can see a series of actual conversations taking place between the characters. The second thing happening is a series of monologues, only slightly different, that tell the same basic story, albeit vaguely. The dialogue of the series is hard to piece together completely, which is why I looked it up to try to find the best approximation I could. And it seems when you unscramble all the dialogue, it tells a few conversations, in which Jack talks about having a secret, and Jane talks about having seen something when she was younger near a harbor, and them talking about getting a phone call from a man in a green suit, and then there being a man in a green coat outside of their apartment, possibly stalking them. In the context of rabbits, a lot of things are hard to really make sense of, but when combined with Inland Empire, some of these elements start to make sense. My current best guess, which I can only really call a guess, is that rabbits takes place inside of the mind of Nikki in Inland Empire. Granted that Susie is one of the characters in the rabbits shorts, I'd imagine that means that this is all part of Nikki's psyche in some way, Sue being the name of a character that Nikki plays. Now for the film within a film. 
Inland Empire is about the creation of a film named On High and Blue Tomorrows. The film is a remake of an unfinished German film named Four Seven, which itself was based on a Polish gypsy folktale. The lead actor of On High and Blue Tomorrows, Devin, claims that he thought it was an original script. The fact that the film is a remake itself could be a commentary on films and storytelling in general, as if to say that all stories come from somewhere, with Inland Empire being no exception. The original film was said to be cursed, and the two leads died. The director of On High and Blue Tomorrows never explained whether he meant that the two lead actors died while filming 4-7, or that the two lead characters die in the story, but this idea of stories within stories and films within films, and art imitating life, life imitating art, are major ideas in Inland Empire that play out in a variety of ways. The title, On High and Blue Tomorrows, is given context by the conversation between the two homeless women. One of the women turns to Sue, who is dying, and says, I'll show you light now. It burns bright forever. No more blue tomorrows. You won't hide me. Obviously, this is referring to dying and going to heaven. It's interesting how the phrase blue tomorrows can double as both a positive and negative thing, in that blue can refer to emotions, depression, negativity, sorrow, and so on, while the term can also refer to the sky, a cloudless day, with cloud-free sunny days generally seen as a sign of goodness and positivity. On High and Blue Tomorrows, then, would probably translate out to simply death, or possibly going to heaven, but simultaneously it'd be referring to a hopeful future in some way. Later, it's revealed that the apartment that the rabbits live in is apartment 47, 47, just like the title of the original film. So it might be implying that inside of the apartment is death or heaven, or both, via the connection between 47 and On High and Blue Tomorrows. After all, in Eraserhead, death and heaven were connected with Henry experiencing heaven in his last moments before death. We see a similar thing happen towards the very end of Inland Empire, which takes place inside of the apartment 47. The story of On High and Blue Tomorrows is initially very simple, with a man named Billy and a woman named Sue having an affair together, both of them married. In a sense, this connection between death and heaven could serve as a nice metaphor for their affair, a moment of heaven but also signing away their own deaths, whether that be the death of their marriage or a literal death, a tragedy along the lines of Romeo and Juliet. Sue even refers to the outcome of their potential affair as Blue Tomorrows, as though to say that if they do have an affair, they're going to die. However, the story becomes extremely complex by the end, though it's made intentionally ambiguous whether the complex parts of the film are meant to be On High and Blue Tomorrows or Inland Empire itself. Since On High and Blue Tomorrows is so convoluted, cut up chronologically and edited weirdly, and seems to jump around from location to location, I thought it'd be fun to try to piece together the full story of the film within a film to help make sense of Inland Empire as a whole. It's probably not entirely accurate, and I invite anybody watching to try to figure out what they think the order of events is. So here goes. Susan Blue is a woman who was abused by several men in her life, and grew up to be distant emotionally from men as a result. At some point she marries Piotrek, a Polish man, and the two lived together, possibly in the Inland Empire. Unfulfilled, she finally meets the man of her dreams with Billy's side, who she has an affair with. Piotrek catches them in the act, but says nothing. Sue gets pregnant and worries that her husband will find out about the affair and have them both killed. Sue confesses her love to Billy in front of his wife. Piotrek reveals that he can't father children, meaning he knows she cheated on him and beats her. Piotrek presumably joins the circus after this, and he moves to Eastern Europe, and through those connections he gets involved in a plot to kill someone, which I'd assume would be Billy and Sue. Sue has a son, raises him as a single mother, and eventually the son dies. Sue's life then falls apart and she ends up living on the street as a prostitute. Eventually she finds a man to talk to about all of the things that happened to her. The man then tries to turn her over to Piotrek, but she escapes and ends up being killed by the angry wife of Billy's side. She dies on the streets of LA. The usage of blue as a color, symbolic of sorrow and of death, is interesting because of the prominent use of blue in Lynch's previous films, especially Blue Velvet and Mulholland Drive. 
The usage of blue may be for the same purpose in Mulholland Drive. For example, with the blue key, the blue box, and the blue walls of Diane's apartment, all foreshadowing Diane's eventual death in that film. There was also the woman at Club Silencio with the blue hair, who at the end of the film signified Diane's death when she said Silencio at the end. It's important to note that Inland Empire is essentially a film within a film within a film, because the film of Inland Empire is being shown to a woman who we see a few times throughout the film, and On High and Blue Tomorrows is a film that exists within another film that we as a film-going audience are watching unfold. It becomes sort of an infinite regression of fiction and metafiction. Are you keeping up still? Because we haven't even begun to unravel the film yet. Of the main roles, the first worth noting is Laura Dern playing Nikki Grace, a former star actress who is living married to a rich man, but is past her prime and is hoping to make a comeback. Nikki plays the role of Sue Blue in the film On High and Blue Tomorrows, and during the second act, the film revolves almost entirely around Sue, with no mention of Nikki at all. The third act returns back to Nikki. Justin Thoreau plays Devin, a famous actor who has chosen to play Billy, the man that Sue has an affair with in On High and Blue Tomorrows. During the second act, Justin's role decreases significantly, and he's just about gone by the time the third act comes around. Peter J. Lucas is Piotr Kroll, though I never caught any other names he goes by in the film. During Inland Empire, he plays the rich man and husband of Nikki, and he seems to also play Sue's husband in scenes of On High and Blue Tomorrows. He also plays the man in the green coat, who we only see once in the entire film. Another important character is the Phantom, who is also given the name Crimp. This man is Sue's neighbor, possibly the lost girl's pimp or boyfriend or husband. He's also a circus performer who can hypnotize people, and he's seen briefly towards the end of the film as some sort of symbolic manifestation, possibly of Nikki's worst fears. His role reminds me a little bit of the mystery man in Lost Highway, as well as the old couple in Mulholland Drive. The last character I'll mention for now is a Polish prostitute who is known only as Lost Girl in the credits. She is watching the events of Inland Empire unfold on a TV screen, and in a sense she's sort of the main character, or at least a main character in her own way. The tagline, A Woman in Trouble, is a pretty accurate description of one of the overarching themes of the film, as well as the general plot. Now, hypothetically, you could make a case for any woman in the film to be the mentioned woman in trouble, but I'll present three main possibilities for the woman in trouble that the film is referring to. The first is Sue, the woman in On High and Blue Tomorrows. She's very much in trouble because she's putting herself at risk of being possibly murdered by her husband for having an affair. The second is Nikki, the woman playing Sue, who not only may be having an affair of her own, but even if she isn't, she's in trouble because she's losing her grip on sanity through the world of On High and Blue Tomorrows, which she seems to be completely psychologically and emotionally lost in, which is evidenced not only by the descent into madness that occurs in the film's second act, but also by the fact that the scenes of her walking around in the real-life streets of Los Angeles are later revealed to be nothing but a set, a continuity error that was intentionally placed most likely to call attention to the immersion in the world of the film within a film. The third possible woman in trouble is the woman that we see watching the events of Inland Empire unfold through a TV screen. As a matter of fact, it's almost a trick question because the answer is that all three women are, in a way, the same woman. Sue is a character that Nikki portrays. Nikki didn't necessarily write the character, but she clearly becomes lost in the world that the character inhabits, as if to say that she connects deeply on an emotional level with the character in some way. This is very much true of the woman watching Inland Empire, as she becomes lost in the world of Inland Empire, and becomes emotionally connected to Nikki, which eventually ends with a kiss between them where it's revealed that Nikki never really existed. In reality, Nikki doesn't. Nikki is just a character in a film, and yet the connection that this woman felt to Nikki was so powerful that it felt as if she was actually really right there. This is a major theme of Inland Empire, that of distinguishing the false reality of fictional storytelling and the honest reality of the emotional fulfillment one can feel by engaging with those stories being told. It's revealed to Nikki that Sue was never real, and it was all just a film. And then it's revealed to the woman that Nikki was never real either. But just as Sue was a part of Nikki, Nikki is a part of this woman. And Nikki and this woman are part of us as well, in a way. The themes of the film have to do with gender, women, and the abuse of women, particularly by men, especially their own husbands. Prostitution, the way in which film affects those who make the films as well as those who watch the films. Infidelity, the nature of fiction and how it can impact us on a deep level despite not even being real. 
the disillusionment that comes with discovering that everything you cared about or thought you knew was fake, the ways in which modern life can distort your mind psychologically, death, heaven, time, and how it affects things, and many, many, many more themes. So now that we've discussed the things that are necessary to even begin to understand the film, let's finally dive deep into Inland Empire. The film opens with Axon N, the self-proclaimed longest-running radio play in history, which sets the stage for the first scene we see of a prostitute, the lost girl. I never was able to fully figure out what Axon N's presence in the film was supposed to mean, but what I can gather is it highlights the false nature of what's going on, in a sense that Axon N is a play, a work of fiction, and by association it's calling attention to the fiction of the movie itself, as if to remind us that this is all fake. To understand why Lynch would even want to do this, we have to keep in mind the context of Inland Empire as a piece of postmodern art. Inland Empire is trying to deliberately call attention to the idea that everything we're seeing is a work of fiction, because the film is about fiction, and the effect it has on audiences, whether that be the lost girl, or us as viewers. The film is trying to point to the idea that fiction can inspire real change and real feelings in people, and that knowing that the story was constructed for our viewing doesn't affect the fact that the story is very real in a way. The story is real in that it came from the mind of real people, and says real things that we can apply to the real world. The connection we feel in watching a movie doesn't depend on whether or not the movie actually happened, but on whether or not it resonates with our real lives and minds. The Lost Girl watches her TV, which shows most of the unfolding events of Inland Empire, but begins with a scene from Rabbits. One of the rabbits says, what time is it, which calls attention to the overarching theme of time, and how time can be distorted and lost track of. It's worth noting that the three rabbits actors are all played by people from Mulholland Drive, including Jane, played by Laura Herring, who previously played both Camilla Rhodes and Rita, and Susie, played by Naomi Watts, who previously played Diane Selwyn and Betty. As I said before, Sue is the name of a character in On High and Blue Tomorrows, and Sue can already be seen as an aspect of Nikki's person. So that's one of the major connections that makes me think that rabbits are metaphors for uh, Nikki's minor personality. Early in the film, we meet Nikki Grace, as she meets an old Polish woman who is Nikki's new neighbor. In a way, this woman also reminds me of the mystery man from Lost Highway, or the cowboy in Mulholland Drive. She's ominous and set things in motion with her strange words to Nikki. She also reminds me of the phantom from later, who is revealed to be Sue's neighbor in one of the scenes. She tells two stories, one of a young boy and a young girl. The story of the young boy is one where he goes to play outside, and as he does, a reflection is born from him, and that reflection is evil, and it follows him. This is likely a reference to his shadow, but it could be a reference to Carl Jung's psychology concept of the shadow, the dark parts of someone's personality that the person will block out and refuse to see in themselves. Given the themes of gender throughout the movie, I imagine this is referring to the men in the film, the men who have dark parts hiding deep within them that they refuse to acknowledge, the kind of dark parts that lead them to things like spousal abuse. It could just be referring to everyone, though, given that it would make sense to say that Nikki also has dark parts that she's hiding, which unravel through the course of the film. Her shadow could very well be the phantom that we see later in the film. The story of the young girl is one where she goes out to play, getting lost in a marketplace, and finding herself in an alley, claiming this is the way to the past, but it isn't something you remember. Repressed memories, of course, being an aspect of the shadow, and this is where the idea of time as a theme comes into play, where she's being made to look into her past, which again is lost track of. The idea of getting lost in a marketplace and finding yourself in an alley is creepy enough on its own, but these things may be hinting at possible prostitution and rape, both of which, even if coincidental to this particular scene, are prominent parts of the story of Inland Empire overall. Nikki's neighbor also tells her that there's a murder in the film, even though Nikki denies it initially. This is interesting because, like I said before, it's ambiguous whether the director of On High and Blue Tomorrows was referring to the deaths of the lead actors in 4-7, or whether he was referring to the deaths of the lead characters, and in that case, she'd be correct. Additionally, there's an implication of murder by Piotrek, which in the second act seems to be playing Sue's husband, who left her to join the circus. And if I were to guess who he's going to murder, it'd be Billy and Sue. In the third act, the Phantom gets killed by the same gun that Piotrek was given to kill someone with, only instead by Nikki. So in the film overall, there is definitely a murder taking place. 
There's also the supposed murder of Sue by a woman with a screwdriver, and there's the murder of two Polish people, which is most likely an allusion to either 4-7 or the events that inspired the Polish gypsy story that eventually became 4-7. So the foreshadowing is true for the film overall. There are several murders, though if I were to identify one being referred to, it'd be Sue being murdered by the woman with the screwdriver. That scene is ambiguous whether it was a murder or a suicide, but what's interesting is in a more figurative context, the murder isn't so much of the character, but of that aspect of Nikki's mind. The part of her that was lost in the film being killed off by the wrapping up of the shooting of On High and Blue Tomorrows. The woman says that she can't remember what day it is, and says, I suppose if it was 9.45, I would think it was after midnight. This is interesting because in Rabbits they ask the time repeatedly and it progressively gets later until they distinctly say it's past midnight. And the conversation between the two homeless women towards the end of Act 2 mentions how it's after midnight. One of the scenes in Polish also mentions it being after midnight. What's interesting is that aside from Rabbits, all of these references to after midnight coincide with the implications of death. Be it this conversation where the woman talks about murder in the film, or the Polish scene where Piotrek is being handed a gun to kill someone, or the two homeless women talking to each other while Sue dies in an apparent murder between them. Perhaps after midnight refers to death in a sense? This idea that she loses track of time is similar to how Nikki loses track of her reality in the second act, with the chronology of the film becoming virtually non-existent during that section. She's losing track of time. Losing track of life if we could equate the two, which is even basically outright stated in one of Sue's monologues. The neighbor also says actions do have consequences, and yet there is the magic. This is interesting, though I would consider it mostly a coincidence, because one of the major themes of the film I've noticed is the magic of filmmaking, of art, and how a woman such as Nikki can sacrifice and be put through such misery and pain for the sake of a character in a film, but that despite all the pain she underwent, there is light in the situation and that her story, both her real life story and the story of the character she portrays, can give hope and inspiration to another. This plays into the soundtrack for the film as well, where three of the most prominent artists feature on the soundtrack are Etta James, Little Eva, and Nina Simone. All women who brought joy to people through their singing, and all women who were abused by men at some point in their lives. It's possible that Lynch is looking at these artists, actresses, and women in the spotlight, seeing the real lives behind the scene, as well as what people saw up front, and sympathizing with the troubles they went through, while appreciating the positivity they may have brought to many others, including other women who have been through similar troubles. She also says, If it were tomorrow, you would be sitting over there, and points. This sort of breaks the fourth wall, where the scene transition ties in with the acknowledgement that she would be sitting in that spot, which turns out to be the case. It also shows the blurring of time that gradually unfolds over the course of the film. Of course, this transition also calls into question whether or not that conversation actually ever took place, or was just a dream or symbolic or something like that. And like I said before, the film is an exercise in postmodernism, and I don't know if Lynch was necessarily caring about dream narratives as much this time around. Rather, he's outright admitting that none of this happens, while simultaneously trying to make the point that even though none of this is really happening, it doesn't change the fact that it can feel real, and the, the message can be real, and it can influence people to do real things, and it doesn't change that the feelings we get while watching this movie are real. This may even be somewhat of a defense of his own work, which has often been criticized for making no sense. Such criticisms come from a presupposed belief that films necessarily have to make sense, which probably has to do with immersion in a world and a story. After all, if the world and story don't allow you to suspend your disbelief, then they no longer feel real. But in actuality, they are no more or less real than a film that intentionally breaks your suspension of disbelief. What is real, regardless of the internal logic of the film, is the feeling you get while watching the film. I've heard people say that Lynch seems to make movies for himself and only himself, and I think that's a disservice to who he is as a director. If that were the case, he would have never made The Elephant Man, Dune, Twin Peaks, and arguably Blue Velvet. I don't think Inland Empire is about Lynch displaying his own ego or serving only himself. I think he's getting across a lot of different messages in a way that is best suited to how he can convey them. He's a master of surrealism, and surrealism to me has always been about emotional realism first and foremost. If you can find a way to make something meaningful and provocative in an emotional way, then the logic of the film can be exploited or even abandoned altogether if it suits what you're going for. And that's what I think characterizes Lynch's films best. About 35 minutes into the film, we meet a brown-haired woman who is credited as Doris Side. 
In On High and Blue Tomorrow, she plays Billy's wife, Billy side and Doris side. She reveals that she was hypnotized to kill someone with a screwdriver, and then reveals that she's been stabbed with a screwdriver, possibly by herself, but possibly by Sue. If we're going to even assume any chronology in this movie, or even in the movie within a movie, then this would be a scene from On High and Blue Tomorrows. It would take place possibly before she kills Sue with a screwdriver, but it could also be after. It's really hard to tell. I guess it's fair that the blurring of time is a theme of this film, so for us as an audience, the chronology would make sense thematically to be hard to follow. In the context of the film as a whole, this scene helps give context to the Phantom character, who it's never directly revealed is influencing people towards murder. She talks about being at a bar, and one of the later monologues of Sue talks about the Phantom having gotten into a barroom fight one night, with everyone there ending up at the police station except for him because he managed to escape, possibly through hypnosis. Maybe he also initiated the bar fight. So either this happened immediately after the bar fight, but long before Sue's death, or it happened long after the bar fight, and probably after Sue's death. Infidelity plays a key role in the plot, and is a prominent theme of the film overall. Affairs are always an ugly situation, but I feel as though Lynch might be looking a bit further into the motivations that lead people towards having affairs. Affairs were consistent features of Eraserhead, Twin Peaks, Lost Highway, and Mulholland Drive. In Eraserhead, the affair was what set off the final act of the film in which Henry goes insane and ends up dying. It seemed to be a condemnation of Henry's actions. In Twin Peaks, pretty much everyone was having an affair with each other, and that was partially a parody of soap operas, so I imagine that had a lot to do with it. In Lost Highway, there was a double-sided approach, where Pete is cheating on his girlfriend in a morally corrupt way, whereas Alice is cheating on her quote-unquote boyfriend, Mr. Eddie, a gangster who is revealed to have basically forced Alice at gunpoint to be his. So for her, it's an escape from an awful situation, whereas with Pete, it's him slipping into the dark underbelly of society, in a typical film noir fashion. That section of Lost Highway was also a deconstruction of the fantasy narrative that the main character, Fred, had carved out for himself. Perhaps the deconstruction and critique of the film noir stereotypes as well. None of it was really real in the context of Lost Highway's story. In Mulholland Drive, there was a potentially real, though ambiguous, affair between Camilla and Diane. Either Camilla called off the affair before anyone found out, right before getting engaged with Adam Ketcher, or alternatively, Diane just fantasized about having Camilla as her love because Diane was jealous of everything Camilla had that Diane had didn't. So, in other words, there's a lot going on with affairs in Lynch's films, and they play often key roles in the revealing of themes. Now, on the other hand, Inland Empire is more explicitly about an affair. In the film within a film, Nikki's character and Devin's character are having an affair that will supposedly get them killed. In the filming of On High and Blue Tomorrows, there seems to be a possibility that an actual affair either has bloomed or will bloom between the two actors while filming. This, of course, brings back the connotations of a curse on the film, and the death of the two leads in the previous version. Later, interestingly enough, we find two people dead in the film, I believe in the Polish scenes. One of them was implied to have been possibly sleeping with the prostitute from the beginning, the lost girl, and her boyfriend, or possibly her pimp, uh, or both, is upset at this and may have had the man murdered. The woman who was murdered was, I believe, the actress who plays Doris Side, aka Billy Side's wife. And the man who was found dead? The man who might be sleeping with the Polish woman? The actor who plays Nikki's husband. So there's an interesting connection there, with the two people being cheated on and the film being the ones who end up dead. It's hard to tell if these scenes are in reference to the Polish gypsy story that inspired 4-7, or if it's another scene in On High and Blue Tomorrows, but this is where the intersection of the themes of death and infidelity lie. It may be a way of saying that, by losing their significant others, they're as good as dead. In a world like Hollywood where appearances matter so much, I'm sure being cheated on or cheating on someone can do a lot to tarnish reputation. Harry Dean Stanton, who plays the director's assistant, mentions how he used to raise rabbits, which may be a reference to the web series, though if it is, I can't really say what it means. Piotrek pulls Devin aside and says, My wife is not a free agent. I don't allow her that. The bonds of marriage are real bonds. The vows we take, we honor and enforce them for ourselves, by ourselves, or if necessary, they are enforced for us. Either way, she is bound. Do you understand this? There are consequences to one's actions, and there would certain be consequences to wrong actions. 
dark they would be. And inescapable. Why instigate a new Tosano? This speech implies that Piotrek might in fact kill Devin if he has sex with Nikki. It also directly ties back into the new neighbor who talked about how actions have consequences. It also shows that Nikki is not a free agent. In a sense, Piotrek owns her. Like I said before, the film has themes of men abusing women, and by the constant back and forth between married couples and prim pimps and prostitutes, it might be making a commentary on how certain marriages can almost be a form of prostitution. Nikki is bound to Piotrek and it evidently has nothing to do with love. Perhaps she married because she was coerced, or maybe she married because it was the only way to not fall apart in the Hollywood industry like what happened in Mulholland Drive with Diane. Perhaps she really did once love him, but at some point things turned south. Or maybe she married him as a symbol of status. Either way, there's a clear disconnect in the first act between Nikki and her husband, with no real signs of love between the two. Early on, Lynch is establishing Piotrick as someone who isn't really worth loving, which helps set the stage for the second act. The film also makes a point of demonstrating that Nikki's acting, and arguably Devin's acting, isn't as good until the two actors start to fall in love for real. This coincidentally mirrors our own immersion into f movies as filmgoers. The less immersed we are, the more we'll focus on technical aspects such as the acting. And the more immersed we get, the more emotionally vo involved, the more we'll get lost in the movie and not focus so much on the technical aspects. In a sense, they're focusing too much on acting the part, and not enough on living the part. But living the part too thoroughly has its own consequences, which we'll see in the second act of the film. In all of the On High and Blue Tomorrow's filming scenes, Lynch makes a point to show the actors' reactions to the scenes after the director cuts. And around the 50 minute mark, there's a love scene where Nikki is clearly more passionate than any of the previous scenes. And after the cut, the music continues and she continues to stare into Devin's eyes. She's become so immersed in the role that it's starting to extend beyond just the scene. The film does seem to make an overall point about not becoming too immersed in a film and being able to separate real life from film, which it hints at through the overall plot of the film as well as through fourth wall breaking in order to shatter the immersion for the audience, to keep us living in real life and not putting ourselves into the clearly fake world that he's created. Things first start to really unravel when she talks about how her husband will kill them both if he finds out, and then says that this sounds like dialogue from our script. The director cuts and the scene is revealed to be filming for On High and Blue Tomorrows. Nikki is becoming lost in the role and is having trouble distinguishing the role from real life at this point. In a scene, Nikki and Devin are having sex. The affair finally has fully begun. The scene is bathed in a blue light. Blue, as I've talked about before, is a color representing death. So perhaps the blue light is foreshadowing that these two have basically signed away their own deaths through the act of cheating. We see Piotrek watching them from out of their view. Nikki tells a story that happened yesterday, but she knows it's tomorrow. Again, referring to the blurring of time. It's hard to say when the first act ends and the second act begins, but the blurring of time and the ambiguity of whether we're seeing Nikki and Devin or Sue and Billy in scenes is where the film starts to descend into a deeper layer of unreality that completely derails with the second act. In this scene, Nikki eventually says, Devin, it's me, Nikki, which again blurs the nature of this scene. Is it real life or just another scene in On High and Blue Tomorrows, with Nikki breaking the fourth wall because she's forgetting who she is? The very next scene is Nikki's story coming true. She sees the logo for Axon N crudely written onto a wall. As I said before, my best guess as to the usage of Axon N is to highlight the fakeness of what's going on. It points into the sets where On High and Blue Tomorrow's is filmed. Of course, needless to say, the content of that film is fake. But this is where I'd say the second act of the film begins. It's when reality truly unravels as she walks in and sees herself in the past, both yesterday and tomorrow. And it's revealed that the person that intruded on the script reading earlier in film was Nikki herself from the future. Or perhaps Sue. Regardless, Axon N points to everything we're about to see being fake, or just a radio play in a sense. It's also worth noting that the scene parallels the scene in Lost Highway in which Fred walked into a dark hallway and came out the other side to see things unravel. Both scenes are the powder keg that sets off the events of the film in full motion. 
As Sue flees from Devon, we see the man in the green coat, hiding and watching from a set in the distance. The man in the green coat was mentioned before in Rabbits, apparently stalking the rabbits. Like I said, the rabbits may be a metaphor for Nikki's mind, and in a sense, the man is checking on the rabbits, scaring them and having an ominous presence over them. This would suggest, if my assumption is accurate, that Nikki's husband has an ever-looming presence over her, in this scene physically and in general mentally as well. Sue meets a group of prostitutes, who eventually reveal to her that when she closes her eyes and then reopens them, she'll see someone familiar. When she does that, she sees, through X on N, the lost girl, who tells her to use a cigarette to erase him in the silk, by burning a hole through it, and then looking through the hole. The idea that the lost girl is someone familiar is interesting. Perhaps not because the girl herself is familiar, but because the idea of the girl is familiar. Mahal and Drive carried some lightly hinted ideas of failed actresses becoming prostitutes. Maybe Nikki, as a successful actress, knows a lot of women who failed and became prostitutes because they may have had no other choice, and so meeting a lost girl would be all too familiar to her. And Nikki is definitely familiar to the lost girl, who has been watching the events unravel from a TV screen this whole time, and later it's implied that Nikki and Sue never really existed and were all just in the lost girl's head. So in that sense, it would go without saying that the two are familiar. There does seem to be a comparison in the film between abusive husbands and pimps, and abused wives and prostitutes, so it could be that the film is making a point about how women forced to marry rich, controlling men like Piotrick are, in a way, prostitutes, just as lost as the lost girl watching the movie. When Sue finally burns the hole in the silk and looks through it, we see a clip of a watch in reverse. Time is reversing, again, showing the blurring of chronology as a major feature of the film. Nikki is basically Diane in an alternate life where, instead of failure, be she becomes a success. But the Hollywood industry spits her back out because women have a limited time of success because of the way in which women are valued in the industry. She's trying to get back, and the idea is that she may have had a tough time with Hollywood and with men, but she still managed to use her performance and her skills and artistry to save someone else, to help someone else in need. When she looks through the silk, she sees the lost girl's life with what appears to be her pimp, where they fight and he ends up beating her. The man playing the pimp is also the man who plays the phantom. Things get really ambiguous around the hour 20 mark. We see the rabbits again, and the lights go out and turn red, and for a brief moment we see Jack fade into frame before fading out. We then see him at the desk that Sue is about to go to, and we see Sue guided by a hand towards the stairs that lead to the desk where she tells her stories. This is breaking the chronology, as these scenes are shown to occur after Sue is living on the streets of LA as a prostitute, which is towards the end of the film, but right before she gets stabbed to death. Jack is the only rabbit to actually leave out the door to go out into the world, and this is the second time in the film that he does this. If we do think of the rabbits as aspects of Nikki's psyche, then maybe Jack is Nikki's shadow, or maybe Jack is alternatively the masculine force in her life. As the men in her life dominate her, there's a force, force inside her head that watches her too, and it's Jack. It's a stretch, but the rabbits are very clearly important thematically, and the way in which Jack fades in, bathed in red light, suggests that Jack is not a force of good. Sue's story that she tells just about completes the picture that Rabbits presents in the dialogue. I mentioned before the monologues that tell the same story. Well, Sue explains what the story means rather directly. It's a story about an attempted rape that happened to Sue. She said when she was 15, she gouged a man's eye out while he was trying to rape her and pushing her legs apart. This ties into the Rabbits monologue which uses phrases like, The socket drips, tearing open red and wiggling legs high, and eye opens, darkness. She also mentions, A lot of guys change. They don't change, but they reveal. In time, they reveal what they really are. You know what I mean? I assume this gives a lot of context to Piotrek and his marriage with Nikki, that she thought he was different until it was too late and is now stuck with a man who is not as good as she once thought. Perhaps he has it in with the Polish Mafia, similar to the Piotrek we see in the second act. Maybe, like Piotrek's character in the second act, he quickly abandoned her in an emotional sense, for money or for some other reason. Perhaps like the Phantom, he's essentially an abusive pimp. While it's ambiguous as most of the film is, I'm fine with the ambiguity because it leaves just enough information to lead you down several paths, rabbit holes if you will, which could all be valid and all make interesting points about the nature of the themes being presented. 
It's also possible, though really dark to think about, that Jack represents, in a way, the part of Sue or Nikki's psyche that is left over from the psychological scarring of an attempted rape and of abuse through the years. After all, Susie and Jack tell the same story in Rabbits, albeit slightly tweaked, but almost the exact same wording, and that story refers to a time where Sue, or perhaps Nikki herself, was a victim of attempted rape. This might explain the scene of Jack walking into the room as he sits at the desk in the same spot that Sue is going to later sit at in order to tell her story of the attempted rape that happened to her at 15. Given that the female rabbits are played by the two leads from Mulholland Drive, a lot could be said about the parallels between Diane, Camilla, and Nikki. Nikki is kind of symbolic of both Diane and Camilla, and by extension Betty and Rita. Betty and Rita are just characters in Diane's head, just as Jane and Susie are characters in Nikki's head. Nikki is both in a sense a failed actress and successful. Camilla married a rich director which helped keep her career alive, and Nikki managed to not need a career by marrying rich. Just like Diane, her Hollywood dream died, and so when she got a second chance with On High and Blue Tomorrows, she dove in so far that it ended up taking control of her life and driving her off the deep end. But through that process, she learns a lot of things, such as the nature of her relationship with her husband, the nature of women's role in the entertainment industry, the issues of women being abused and forced into prostitution, the perils of adultery, and perhaps more importantly, the way that passion and understanding can impact your art in a way that which resonates with others, perhaps helping them in some way, even if intangible. Sue mentions a little girl who's staring off at something and started screaming, and claiming she saw the end of the world. This might be a callback to the story that Nikki's neighbor told about the young girl who gets lost in a marketplace and goes down an alley. Jane the Rabbit talks about something happening to her when she was seven, and that story paralleled the references to a harbor with Susie's story of distant ships. Regardless of any implications these connections might have, I think they all play into this idea of the dark corners of someone's mind. Nikki's neighbor talked about how this is the way to the past, but it's something you don't remember. Which I bring up again because of the idea of rep repressed memories, or rather, repressed trauma. Trauma from a young age that you block out later in life, but that looms over you in a way. The lost girl's pimp, or possibly boyfriend or husband, tells her about a murder that happened to a friend of the lost girl, who presumably she is having sex with against the will of this man. The dead man is revealed to be a man who looks exactly like Piotrek. I don't think this is actually Piotrek, though. I think it's just a Polish man who is unrelated. Interestingly enough, the lost girl shows up in a scene with Piotrek being handed a gun to go kill who I'd assume is Billy and Sue. This scene then fades, revealing to be a mirror of the rabbits. The scene seems to be taking place inside of the lost girl's head, and the fade is comparing the two, suggesting that lost girl and Nikki are essentially the same person, which is true when you consider that the lost girl is watching Nikki's story as a movie. Whatever the lost girl interprets the film as is what the film is, and so whatever happens to Nikki, it's all in lost girl's head, and how she interprets it informs who Nikki is to her and to us. This seemingly self-inserted scene where she's in the scene and then disappears, so showing that she was never really there, may also be a commentary on, well, people like me. Audience goers who watch the film. By interpreting the film the way I'm doing now, I'm projecting at least some aspect of myself into the film. By virtue of the fact that my interpretation forms inside of my own mind, whatever I say in this video will be from me. And while I always do my best to try to tell you what I believe the film's message is, rather than just share my own message with the film as an excuse, it's hard to get around the fact that, to some extent, I'm just projecting myself onto the film in order to understand it better. But I think that Inland Empire isn't condemning people for doing that, as many detractors of film analysis have said of Lynch's films, the idea that they shouldn't be analyzed. Well, analysis is one form of enjoyment, one form of engagement with a movie, and I think Inland Empire is, rather than trying to dissuade anyone from finding meaning in the film, it's encouraging it, saying that as an audience, projecting ourselves into what we see is to some degree inevitable, and there's actually worth to come from that. The rabbit's voices get distorted when they say, it was the man in the green coat, and it had something to do with the telling of time. Telling of time may be referring to death in this case, because of the idea that past midnight refers to death, as the same or similar phrasing has been used multiple times, just juxtaposed next to mentions of murder, and the passage of time inevitably leads to death anyways. The revelation, the man in the green coat is going to murder. This is why he is seen staring at Devin and Nikki, or alternatively, Billy and Sue, as they walk by. He's going to kill them both. 
In Sue's monologue, she also mentions how she's focused on figuring out yesterday because she's not excited for tomorrow and today is slipping by. This again relates to the blurring of time. Tomorrow is the passage of time, death, and yesterday is her past, the previous trauma she encountered, and today is just a big blur. She mentions how, after the death of her son, her life fell apart and it felt like watching a movie. This might be referring to dissociation. When encountering severe trauma, people can dissociate and feel detached from reality. And one description I've used is that of like watching a movie. She doesn't feel in control of her actions, but she's still witnessing them happen, as though she were watching them unfold like a movie. And this would be an accurate way of describing Nikki's performance in On High and Blue Tomorrows. She's so lost in the role that she's no longer herself. It's just happening to her, and she's just experiencing it like a movie. After the events unfold where Sue tells her story to the man and then gets stabbed by Billy's wife, she starts to die near some homeless woman, and one of them shares a story about a friend of hers. The story the homeless woman tells relates a lot to the themes of the film. In the story she tells, her friend Nico wears a blonde wig, and when she does, she looks just like a movie star. But now she's turning tricks and doing hard drugs. The woman says that even girls fall in love with her when she's wearing her blonde wig, which hints at Nikki in a few ways. She's basically talking about Nikki, a washed up movie star who's blonde but can make even girls such as the lost girl fall in love with her when she puts on her wig, which to me is comparable to performing, playing a fake role of a blonde woman like how Nikki plays a fake role of Susan Blue. Nico ends up hopeless as she has a tear in her vaginal wall that's going to kill her, and she can't afford a doctor who will help her with it, so she resigns to her fate and ends up buying a monkey. Nikki is seen at the end of the film in the credits with a monkey in her mansion, and Nico and Nikki are fairly similar names. Nico is an obvious parallel of Nikki. It's also a nice transition back into the real world of the film outside of On High and Blue Tomorrows. It's the end of the second act, and the big revelation that On High and Blue Tomorrows is as much Nikki's story as it is Sue's. She dies, and one of the women tells her about how there will be no more blue tomorrows. No more sorrow, nor most, no more sunshine, she's going to heaven now. It's finally revealed that the second act is all just the filming of On High and Blue Tomorrows, and that none of it was real. Nikki is shaken and decides to walk out. She notices that everything is just sets. None of it was real, even though it still feels so real. She walks out and walks into a theater where she sees some clips of On High and Blue Tomorrows, as well as footage of herself watching the screen. She realizes that it was all just a movie. And just like dissociation, she's watching her actions unfold on a screen, watching it like a movie. And she herself is in a bigger movie, Inland Empire. She then sees a man walk up a set of stairs and follows him. She finds a room with a label on the door, Axon N. Another sign that this is fake. She opens it and it's the apartment she was in during On High and Blue Tomorrows. She finds Piotrick's gun. Eventually she makes her way toward the back of the theater, and along the way she ends up in a green hallway and finds the apartment 47, 47. Outside, she encounters the Phantom and shoots him. His face ends up having her face superimposed over it in a strange scene where it seems to be implying that the Phantom is, in a way, perhaps her shadow? I mean, the indication here is that the Phantom is a part of her in some way. She confronts it and destroys it. The Phantom is a hypnotist. He hypnotizes people to do things. And perhaps the movie is saying that a person's shadow has that same hypnotic ability to influence your actions. She opens room 4-7 and inside is the set of the rabbits. She then looks into a blue light, which I think is a camera. She's coming to the realization that her entire life is part of a movie outside of herself. Her mind, the room 4-7, her entire existence is a projection. She then breaks out of the movie and finds the lost girl. She kisses her, then disappears. She was never real, it was all just a movie. Earlier I mentioned how, like how Eraserhead ends with final moments in heaven, Inland Empire ends similarly. Nikki staring into the light of the camera is her leaving the film. If you could see the film she's in as her first life, and outside of the film as an afterlife, then she is essentially staring into the light of heaven, such as the trope of walk towards the light would suggest. What's interesting about this, although I really doubt Lynch was going for this, is that if you were to see a character's role in a movie as her life, then what that actress playing that character does with her life after doing that role is a life after that first life, an afterlife of sorts. This idea that a character's lifespan is contained within a movie is also aided by the fact that Sue dies at the end of On High and Blue Tomorrows, and when Nikki transcends the boundaries of the film she's stuck in, she ascends into an afterlife, a heaven of sorts. It's an interesting idea of a metamythology, 
though it's more of a thought experiment than an interpretation. With the ending for The Lost Girl, if you ask me, it's likely that she's a former prostitute who had settled down at some point, either by the influence of seeing Nikki's story unfold or before. She had hypothetically placed herself and her husband into the story, putting her husband in a villainous role, perhaps because she thinks he might be cheating on her, or some sort of trust issues going on. And the Phantom could likely be her former pimp, who had abused her and who she had to get away from. And in a sense, his presence was felt while watching the movie, which is why he shows up so many times. He represents something dark looming over the lost girl. And by seeing the movie, she grew to understand why her family is worth it, and how much better things are now. By contrast of seeing so many failing relationships through the course of On High and Blue Tomorrows, and Nikki's story as an actress. The film as a whole was basically the lost girl confronting her inner demons vicariously through the story of the film she was watching. Nikki kissing the lost girl was that transfer of hope for a better tomorrow, from one woman in trouble to another. And the final shot with Nikki seeing herself in a blue dress, that's of course in reference to On High and Blue Tomorrows, suggesting that she's passed on to heaven, which could mean death or could mean she is just living a happier life, knowing that her story has helped another woman in trouble. It's the metaphorical death of the old Nikki and a hopeful, better tomorrow. Overall, the film is a brick wall of surrealism. To even begin to understand it takes a lot of dedication, and I doubt that what I've said covers even half of what could be said about the film. There are plenty of things I left out, and this is free to anybody watching to share your thoughts on the film and the meaning of anything, especially things that I didn't talk about. The film is another one of Lynch's masterpieces, and probably his most impressively complex film yet. The overall message of the film seems to be that we can overcome the forces, both internal and external, that keep us down, and we can find a good place in life someday, and that our stories can inspire others to find a good place in their life too. The film draws on many inspirations to make this point, and acknowledges the inevitable disconnect that will come from the film not being a true story, while asking audiences to recognize the parallels that such works of fiction have with real life stories, be that our own or the stories of famous women in the entertainment industry. I highly recommend the film and all of Lynch's other films, and I'm glad to be able to finally get this video made. It's been a long time coming. Please, if you have anything you'd like to say, feel free to leave a comment. And of course, I have many more videos in the works, so if you like this and you want to see more, subscribe. Uh, thanks for watching.